Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another live edition. Today's date is February 25th, 2014. My name is Sally Maria Hart, and you're listening to Crystal Kids Radio Show. I am only 15 years old. My website is www.crystalkidsradio.com. Please feel free to visit. If you could be so kind to find your heart to donate on my website, www.crystalkidsradio.com, so it could help with my surgery, and so it could help doing my shows, that would help since I did not make any money off shows. Please support us kids because it takes a lot of work doing it and it comes from my heart. Change thoughts with my children. Today I have a special guest by the name of Dr. Gordon Edwards. Dr. Gordon Edwards and I speak about during the interview about the dangers of nuclear power, Fukushima, and so much more. One thing that gets me upset when they are selling nuclear reactors as a griffing on TV and elsewhere. It is not white. Dr. Gordon Edwards explains the dangers of nuclear power. This interview is very important. And for people who do not know who Dr. Gordon Edwards is, he is one of the world's most well-known experts in nuclear power and its effects. Actually, you can get an extended version of this interview on my website www.crystalkidsradio.com. To listen to more of Dr. Gordon Edwards, because I will be unable to finish the interview today, since we do not have enough time. Let's listen to Dr. Gordon Edwards to learn about the truth of nuclear power, Fukushima, and much more. Hello, Gordon. I'm glad you can make some time out of your busy schedule to come on my show. I understand you're a leading expert on nuclear power and its effects. Can you tell my audience about yourself, please? Hi there, how are you? Natalie Marie, I'm glad to be talking to you. Yes, um, I live in Montreal, and I, uh, I'm married. I have three children and eight grandchildren. And when I was a young man, just graduating from high school, I was very interested in science, and I decided to learn more about it. And so I, I studied science at university, mathematics, physics, and chemistry. And later on, I focused mostly on mathematics, because mathematics is the tool of science that allows you to understand any branch of science, really. And uh, so that's what I did. I became a mathematician. But uh, somewhere along the line, when I was in graduate school, when I was getting my higher degrees, I, I have a doctorate in mathematics, a doctor's degree, which is the highest degree, um, I became uh, very interested in uh, the dangers to the planet from uh, uh, nuclear weapons, for example. Nuclear weapons are very powerful weapons that uh, are sometimes called atomic bombs. And these atomic bombs were first used in 1945, and one of these bombs will destroy an entire city. And uh, they also uh, threaten not only to wipe out human civilization by destroying the cities, but also uh, to poison the planet with these radioactive materials called fallout, radioactive fallout. And these things are harmful to living things, to all living things. And uh, so... I started wondering, well, what, how are we going to have a future that is good for the planet? And it occurred to me that we really should work, scientists and non-scientists together, to really try and make sure that science is only used for the good of humanity and not for weapons of mass destruction. In fact, not for weapons at all, really. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to make this world a pleasant place to live in for all the animals and all the creatures, including ourselves. Yes, you are so right. We need to protect the surf and the children, too. That's right. And, uh, you know, one of the things, Chris Hadfield was the uh, Canadian astronaut who went into space recently, and um, he says that when you're out in space and you look at the Earth, it's, it's this beautiful blue globe. It looks like a ball, and that's a, like a spaceship. It's like a spaceship. We're all living on this spaceship called Earth. And we're all the crew of this spaceship, and we have to work together. Like, if you have the crew of a spaceship, you can't have them throwing bombs at each other or shooting at each other. You have to have them working together because everybody depends upon everybody else. And that's one of the things that the human race is just starting to learn is that, you know, we can't afford to ruin the planet just because we're not happy with the way things are here on Earth because the Earth is the only home we'll ever have. Oh, yes, that's so true. So that's how I got involved in nuclear energy. Now, 
although nuclear energy was first, now what is nuclear energy really? Well, nuclear energy has to do with the atoms. It's something that we only learned about a little over 100 years ago, and that is that everything that we see, everything that we touch, everything that we breathe and that we eat, and even our bodies, are made up of these tiny little things called atoms. And these atoms are so, so tiny that you can't see them at all, not even under powerful microscopes. But uh, an atom has a center part called a core or a nucleus. And that word nucleus refers to the center. And then around the center of the, of the atom are these things in orbit. They're almost like planets in orbit around the sun, only it's at a tiny, tiny, tiny scale. And the nucleus is at the center, and these things called electrons go around the outside. Uh, one way to think about this is to think about a great big stadium with lots of seats. And think of one soccer ball right at the center of the field. Well, that soccer ball would be like the nucleus of the atom. And all of the seats around the outside would be like the electrons that are going around the center. Um, so that's what it is. It's sort of like a miniature solar system. Now, a lot of the energy that we get in the world is from, like, burning fuel, for example, or you can see chemical explosions. You see pictures on television of things blowing up and things exploding. Well, all of that energy really comes from the electrons that go around the outside of the atom. It's actually those electrons that, that produce all the chemical changes in the world. And even when we digest our food, um, we turn the food into our body. How do we do that? Well, our body actually knows how to rearrange the electrons and make new things called proteins and carbohydrates and things that our body can use to build, to build our bodies. And uh, so these atoms are so important to understand in science. They're the basic thing, the basic building blocks of matter. Now, nuclear energy talks about energy that doesn't come from just the electrons on the outside, but comes from the really, really tiny core of the atom, the nucleus. That's why it's called nuclear energy, because it comes from the nucleus. And it turns out that there's an enormous amount of energy that can be released from the nucleus of the atom, the very center. And in fact, when you look up at the sun and you see the sun blazing in the sky, burning, how does it burn forever and ever and ever, it seems, you know? Millions and millions of years, it burns and burns, and it never seems to burn out. Well, actually, all the energy that's in the sun is coming from the nucleus of, of millions, trillions, and zillions of atoms, and it's called nuclear energy. And the nuclear energy that's in the sun is something called nuclear fusion. Now, nuclear fusion, fusion is a word that means combining together, or in, in French, it actually, fusion means melting. So uh, what, what's happening in the sun is that atoms, the nucleus of different atoms are being combined, and when they combine, they release this amazing amount of energy. And that goes on for trillions of years. Now, uh, here on Earth, we don't know how to make fusion work. We've been trying for a long time to try and mimic what the sun does. But we have another kind of nuclear energy, which is called fission. And fission, instead of combining light atoms like happens in the sun where the nuclei get combined, uh, fission is taking very heavy atoms and splitting them. And it turns out that when you split very large atoms apart, that also releases a lot of energy. And so that's what, uh, that's what nuclear energy is here on Earth. Most of the nuclear energy on Earth is really obtained by splitting these heavy, heavy atoms. And the heaviest atom that occurs in nature is a substance called uranium. And so they use uranium as the key element of all nuclear technology on Earth, whether it's nuclear bombs or whether it's nuclear reactors for producing electricity. Mm -hmm. This is the fundamental question, you see, is can you have peaceful nuclear energy? Can you use this nuclear energy for the benefit of mankind without having harmful effects? That's the problem. And it turns out that it's not a very simple problem. There's a, there's a lot of difficulties with using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. And one of the first difficulties is that anybody who tries to use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes can do so uh, because here's what you do. You put uranium, this heavy material, 
You put uranium into a special thing called a nuclear reactor, a special machine. And in this special machine, the atoms are split. The atoms are, are, are chopped apart by things called neutrons, and you get an, an enormous amount of energy released. This energy comes out in the form of heat, and you know what heat can be used to do. It can be used to make things very hot, and in fact, if you heat up water, what do you get? Steam. So it produces a lot of steam by boiling tons and tons and tons of water, and that steam can then be used to turn uh, a wheel uh, that's called steam power. And that steam power, the turning of the wheel, can be used to generate electricity. So basically, what a nuclear reactor is on Earth is just a machine for boiling a lot of water. And the only difference between boiling water with wood or with coal or with oil is how you boil the water. And in the case of a nuclear reactor, the way you boil the water is by splitting uranium atoms. But here's the problem. The problem is that anybody who has a nuclear reactor if, he, if that group or that nation or that uh, institution wants to, they can decide to make nuclear bombs instead. And nuclear bombs are, are uh, very, very dangerous to the human race, very dangerous to not only the neighbors, but to everybody. And uh, so the danger is that by spreading nuclear power around the world for peaceful purposes, we might be mistakenly uh, spreading the bomb as well, and more and more nations can get a hold of nuclear weapons. So this is one strong reason why many people think that nuclear power isn't really a technology that we should be using on Earth. We should not be using it because uh, the thought of people, lots and lots of people, getting their own nuclear weapons is just too scary. Imagine if you had a crazy guy in your neighborhood who didn't really care whether he lived or died, and he just decided for the hell of it to blow off a bomb. Well, this does happen, of course. We know people who do this. They set off bombs. They even kill themselves doing it. They're called suicide bombers. But in the case of a nuclear bomb, you destroy the entire city. Well, uh, it's just not a good idea to have those things around. And this is why a lot of people are opposed to nuclear power, not so much because the idea is bad, but because the dangers of getting nuclear weapons coming out of it is too terrible to think about. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, which is worse, the Hiroshima atomic bombing or the Fukushima nuclear disaster? Ah, good question. Well, actually, the atomic bombing is uh, fundamentally, uh, they're both bad, okay? And I'll explain, I'll explain what the connection is between them. In the case of the nuclear bombs, uh, the, uh, back in 1945, there were two nuclear bombs that were dropped on two Japanese cities. One was called Hiroshima, and the other one was called Nagasaki, and I have visited both of these cities. Now, mm -hmm. the difficulty with these bombs is that they really destroy virtually the whole city, and, uh, and, they, uh, and that causes enormous damage, as you can imagine. Now, imagine that, uh, that there were... Imagine that there was a war in which all these bombs were used. There's thousands of them uh, on both sides, you know, in the hands of different countries. Most of them are owned by the United States of America. They have the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. And Russia comes very close behind with their large stockpile of nuclear weapons. And then there's other countries as well, such as France and Britain and uh, China. Uh, and if these countries were to have a war in which they were to use nuclear weapons, each nuclear weapon can wipe out a whole city. So just by using a fraction of the weapons they have, they could destroy every city in the Northern Hemisphere in a matter of a day. So uh, this is a horrible prospect. It means that human civilization would come to a sudden end because all the hospitals would be gone, all the schools, um, all of the uh, cities would be gone. Um, and uh, humanity would be put right back into the kind of uh, Stone Age, you might say. So, it, and possibly they might even not survive at all, because in addition to the uh, the destruction of the cities, there's so much um, there's so much ash and dirt that is put into the air that it makes it almost impossible to grow food, because the sunlight doesn't get through. It's called a nuclear winter. 
And so for this reason, nuclear weapons are probably, well, they are. There's no doubt about it. They are the greatest threat to the survival of humanity on this planet is nuclear weapons. And the funny thing is, we're the ones who invented them. So <laughs> we are sort of the greatest threat to ourselves in a sense. You know, like it's not other animals that are endangering us. It's the weapons that we built. You had a good point. Now, now the Fukushima disaster is something else. I'll, I'll explain what happened at Fukushima. It's uh, a little bit complicated to understand, so I need to go back and explain a little bit more about the splitting of the atom. Mm -hmm. Please. When you split an atom, um, like a uranium atom, think of it as a big, heavy kind of a grapefruit, okay? And when you split it, you get two pieces, right? Mm -hmm. or sometimes two pieces, sometimes three pieces. And... Um, so um, you do get an awful lot of energy, but you also get these broken pieces of uranium atoms. And it turns out that these broken pieces of uranium atoms are very, very dangerous. They're very radioactive. And what radioactive means is that these, when you split the, the grapefruit, you get pieces which are new atoms. They're new atoms. They're not uranium anymore. And they have many different names. Like some of them are called cesium-137 strontium-90, krypton-85, iodine-131. And the funny numbers that come at the end of the name represents how many particles there are in each piece. So these pieces are made up of particles. They're like marbles, you might say. And those marbles uh, can be counted. And so when you say iodine-131, it means that in the nucleus of that atom, there's 131 particles. Or if you say krypton-85, it means that inside the nucleus of that atom, there's 85 particles, and so on. It, it turns out that uranium has 238 particles, so it's got a lot more particles. And when you split it, when you split a uranium atom, you get these other atoms that have not so many, uh, not so many uh, uh, particles in the nucleus. Well, it turns out that these little atoms that are produced as a byproduct of fission are unstable. They're like little time bombs. And at a certain moment, they will explode and give off damaging, uh, well, uh, do you know the word shrapnel? Shrapnel means like they're pieces of fragments of a bomb that will damage the surrounding human beings or animals that are in the neighborhood. They do a lot of damage, the shrapnel from a bomb explosion. Well, when these atoms explode, these little broken, unstable pieces of atoms, when they explode, they give off energy which is very damaging to living things, and that's called radioactivity. And every time an atom, one of those atoms explodes, it's called a disintegration. That's the word they use, disintegration. And when they measure radioactivity, they talk about how many disintegrations every second. So sometimes they talk about like thousands of becquerels. Becquerel is one disintegration per second. So thousands of becquerels means that you have thousands of atoms disintegrating every single second. Now, when that stuff gets into the environment, it's very damaging to living things, particularly if you eat the food or drink the water containing these things. Suppose, for example, you drink a glass of water, and the water itself is radioactive. Well, that radioactive material gets inside your body, and it's exploding inside your body. And naturally, it causes damage to the cells. And sometimes those damaged cells, not very often, but sometimes those damaged cells will develop into cancers. And sometimes they'll develop into leukemias or other kinds of diseases. Sometimes they can damage the reproductive cells so that the children and the grandchildren might be affected by the damage that was done to their grandparents. So um, all these dangers are obviously not healthy. And for that reason, when you explode an atomic bomb, for example, not only do you destroy a city with the blast, but you also spread these radioactive poisons into the environment. And they stay there for a long time. In fact, we still have radioactive things coming out of the sky uh, from bombs that were exploded way back in the 1940s and 1950s. Those radioactive materials are still way up high in the sky, and they're coming down still onto the ground and uh, consequently, we've already done a certain amount of damage by doing that. Now, the good news is that we have now a, a worldwide treaty which bans the explosion of these bombs in the atmosphere. So they no longer will test these bombs by exploding them in the atmosphere. 
And that way, they're no longer spreading these radioactive materials into the environment. But when you have a nuclear reactor, let's now turn to the peaceful uses of nuclear power, OK? Let's think of a nuclear reactor. On the surface, it looks like a beautiful machine. It's be it is a beautiful machine. Inside the machine, you have the fuel, which is uranium. And the uranium atoms are being split and producing a lot of heat and producing a lot of steam and producing a lot of electricity. And it looks great. It looks like a terrific factory for producing electricity. But here's the problem. Inside the reactor, all these broken pieces of uranium atoms are piling up. And they keep piling up year after year after year. And the radioactivity is so great in the core of the reactor that if a worker went in there, he would be killed in a very short period of time by the radioactivity alone. Just by standing close to one of the irradiated fuel bundles, for example, a worker would be killed in less than 20 seconds by just standing one meter away from it. So um, you can appreciate that this is a dangerous situation in the event of an accident. If, for example, let's suppose some accident occurred whereby the reactor was blown to smithereens. Let's suppose a meteor came from outer space and hit one of these reactors and just released all that radioactive material into the environment. Well, then you have a real catastrophe because it turns out that in one year's time, one of these nuclear reactors will produce more radioactive poisons then you would get from 1,000 atomic bombs. 1,000 Hiroshima bombs would not give you as much radioactive material as in one of these reactors after one year. So this is a real problem, because what happened at Fukushima? At Fukushima, they had six nuclear reactors. They all looked beautiful. They were all very well designed, and they were producing electricity for the Japanese people. And everybody was happy. Everybody thought, wow, are we ever glad we've got these nuclear reactors and we got nice electricity and so on. Along came an earthquake, a huge earthquake. And the earthquake itself didn't really damage the reactors, but it did knock out the electrical supplies, you know, the electricity that comes from outside the plant. Mm -hmm. And when the electricity supplies are cut off, it means you don't have any pumps that are working. Mm -hmm. So, but, but the engineers who build these plants are very smart. And so what they have is they have emergency backup generators. They have a bunch of them so that they can start these generators and generate their own electricity to run the pumps. And they need to do that. You know why? Because even if you shut the reactor down right away, and that's what they did, by the way, when the earthquake hit in 2011, in March of 2011, mm -hmm. this huge earthquake, all the reactors were shut down instantly, automatically, and the, the splitting of the atoms was stopped immediately. There was no more splitting of the atoms. It was stopped. The reactors were shut down. So you'd think, well, if they're shut down, they should be safe. Not really true, because the broken pieces of uranium atoms inside, they're called fission products. That's what they're called. These fission products are so radioactive that they keep on exploding and generating heat even after the reactor shut down, because we don't know how to turn off radioactivity. So the result is that that heat is being produced by the radioactivity and if you don't run pumps to remove the heat, to just pump water through the core of the reactor and wash that heat out of the core of the reactor, then what happens is the temperature is going to go up and up and up and up. And in fact, it's going to go so high that it's going to start melting the entire reactor. And that's what happened at Fukushima. There were three of these reactors actually melted. The core of the reactor melted at an amazingly high temperature, it's 2,800 degrees Celsius. Imagine 2,800 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. that's, much, that's much higher than the melting point of steel. And so when the core starts melting, and why does it melt? The reason it melts is because the pumps aren't working. And why are the pumps not working? Didn't I say they had emergency generators to run the pumps? Ah, yes, they did. They had emergency generators. But guess what? After the earthquake came a tsunami, which is a huge wave of water from the ocean. And this wave of water was so enormous that it just washed right over these reactors. And it made these emergency generators stop working. They got drowned. 
And because they got drowned in water, they couldn't function anymore. They couldn't generate the emergency electricity that was needed. And so what we had here was a total station blackout, a total blackout. That means not only was there no power from outside, but there was also no power from inside. And because of that, the pumps were unable to work. And because of that, since we don't know how to shut off the radioactivity, the radioactivity made the temperature go higher and higher, and that's what melted three out of those six nuclear reactors. Three of them melted down. By the, by the way, the reason those three melted down is because they were the only three that had not been shut down ahead of time. The other three had been shut down way ahead of time, way before the earthquake. But the three that had not been shut down ahead of time, they had a much hotter inventory of these radioactive fission products. And so what happened at Fukushima was uh, a terrible sequence of events. First, the electricity got cut off. Second, the pump stopped working. Third, the temperature shot up. Four, the reactors started melting down. And then something else happened. As the temperature goes up, they start having chemical reactions. You know, sometimes when you heat things, you get chemical reactions happening. Like, for example, paper. If you heat paper to a certain level, you know what happens, it catches fire. Mm -hmm. Well, when it catches fire, that's a chemical reaction. The paper is now reacting with oxygen in the air to produce that fire. Well, uh, as you generate, as the heat goes up, you start getting chemical reactions taking place. And one of these chemical reactions, just like fire gives off smoke, well, one of these chemical reactions gives off a gas called hydrogen gas. And so this hydrogen gas started building up inside the plants and when hydrogen gas gets very hot, guess what happens? It explodes. Mm -hmm. And what happens is we had these reactors started exploding. There were four reactors that exploded. They were called units one, two, three, and four. Uh, the five and six did not explode because they didn't have this problem. They were not having a meltdown. And even number four didn't have a meltdown, but they exploded for a different reason. So we had these four explosions. And you know what that did? that allowed the radioactivity to escape into the atmosphere. And so clouds of radioactivity started going out into the environment. And when, what happens when these clouds go out into the environment is that uh, there's actually, it's like smoke. Think of cigarette smoke, mm -hmm. for example. You've seen cigarette smoke in the air, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you can't see this smoke. It's an invisible smoke. But it, it has lots of different things in it. And when this smoke uh, goes over the land, it starts settling out onto the soil. And so it sticks to the soil. It sticks to the buildings. It sticks to whatever's in its way. And, uh, and it makes those things radioactively contaminated. So the soil itself becomes radioactive, and the buildings become radioactive in the, in the path of this invisible smoke. And that's what happened at Fukushima. So the, so the disaster at Fukushima required hundreds of, well, approximately 100,000 people had to leave their homes and go away to another place and live in, in, in kind of refugee centers, you know, like uh, sometimes they lived in gymnasiums and sometimes they lived in schools. And, but they had to leave their comfortable homes behind and go away and the, the sad thing is that even though this accident happened two and a half years ago, they still can't go back to their homes because the radioactivity is still there. It hasn't gone away. And what's more, they're still having problems with those reactors that melted down. Even though this accident happened two and a half years ago, just think of that, two and a half years mm -hmm. ago. Now, if, you, if your listeners think about a hot stove, if you turn off a stove, how long will it take before the hot, hot, hot elements will get cool enough that you can touch them? Mm -hmm. Well, probably what? Probably in half an hour or an hour, it would probably be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the case with nuclear cores. It turns out that when the nuclear core melts down, it goes right down into the ground, right down to the bottom of the reactor, and sometimes right through the floor of the reactor into the ground below. And the radioactivity cannot be turned off. So guess what? It's impossible to stop the heat from being generated. So the heat is still being generated even two and a half years later. 
And the result of this is that the company called the company is called TEPCO. It stands for Tokyo Electric Power uh, Company. And TEPCO, they have to pump 400 tons of water every day down into the bottom of these reactors and back up again to the surface in order to cool the uranium fuel, which is still generating heat. And the problem is that if they don't keep on cooling it for about 10 years, then it's going to overheat again and release more radioactivity into the environment. So that's why they have to pump 400 tons of water every day. They're doing this right today. As we speak, they're pumping water into the cores of those reactors, and they will do so every day for the next many years. Now, when that water comes back up to the surface, you know what happens? Mm -hmm. It's you know how uh, sometimes you could imagine that if you pumped water down into a hole in the ground and then pumped it back up again, when it comes back up, it's very dirty. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of dirt in it. Well, in this case, it's not just ordinary dirt. It's radioactive dirt. And so the water itself becomes very radioactive because it's got all this radioactive stuff in it. It's not because the water is radioactive. It's because the water contains all this radioactive junk. So they have to build huge tanks. These tanks are so huge. You can get a picture of them on the Internet. If you go to the Internet and look at Fukushima tank, just Google Fukushima tank, and you'll see what they look like. They're huge. They're about two stories high, these tanks, and they're like enormous cubes. And they have already built a 1,000 of these tanks. And they're filling these tanks with the contaminated water that they, they pump down into the ground to cool the reactor cores, then when it comes back up, they have to put them in these tanks because it's too radioactive to release to the environment. And they keep on building new tanks virtually every day. So even as we're talking here on the phone, in Japan, they're probably today building new tanks in order to hold. Tomorrow, there's going to be another 400 tons of water. And the next day, there's going to be another 400 tons of water, and so on, day after day after day. So they're, they're, they've got all these tanks. They even had to cut down a small forest in order to make room to build more tanks. So you see, this accident is not yet over. And, um, and the tanks of water that I'm mentioning is only one of the problems. There's other problems as well. In addition to the fuel that melted down into the ground, that's very, very, it's so radioactive that no worker can even look at it. They can't even, they can't even bend over and look at it because they would get a deadly dose of radiation. Uh, they're, they're, they're sort of like invisible x-rays, but they're so powerful that they would actually kill you. And uh, even when they send robots into these areas where the core has melted down, if they send robots into these areas, you know, uh, to take pictures or whatever, it turns out that the robots only last for about five minutes, and then they just they can't work anymore. It's sort of like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, uh, they, ca they can no longer move because their electronic components have been damaged by the radiation and, and they will no longer work. So even the robots can't really take this radioactive environment for very long. So when you asked me the question originally, which is worse, the atomic bombs or the Fukushima meltdown, <laughs> it's a very good question because they're both bad in different ways. The, the atomic bomb is, is mostly bad because it destroys so much. It, it, literally, it literally levels the buildings. It, makes, it just takes the whole city, and it's just as if you kind of, if it was all made of sand and you just rubbed a, a um, if you took a steam shovel and just sort of rode over it, you know, and just crushed everything and flattened everything. So the bomb has that destructive ability. Now, the Fukushima disaster does not destroy things in that way. But what it does is it causes this enormous problem of radioactive contamination. And that stuff is, in fact, getting into the environment. Every day, in addition to the water that I was telling you about, the 400 tons that they, that they pump down into the reactors and then back up again, mm -hmm. there's also water underneath the reactors that's flowing just because of nature. You know, we have something in nature called groundwater. Groundwater, if you drill, drill down into, even into a rocky area, you can find water. That's how people get wells to drink, to get to drinking water in, in various parts of the world. They drill down and they find water underneath. It's called groundwater. Well, it turns out that at Fukushima, there's an awful lot of groundwater and it flows right under the reactors 
And this groundwater is actually washing some of that radioactivity into the ocean almost every day at about 300 tons per, per day. It's getting washed into the ocean and that's radioactive material as well. And so it's causing problems with the fish. So that the fishermen uh, around this Fukushima plant in Japan, they're not allowed to catch fish. They've been, doing, they've been catching fish for thousands of years there and using it to feed their families and also to sell it to make money. Well, they can't do that anymore because of the radioactivity from this disaster. And gradually, this stuff does make its way into the food chain, into the living things, because what happens is when this stuff goes into the oceans, you might think, well, it's going to get diluted, right? It's going to get, like, it's going to get watered down, and it's probably going to fall down into the bottom of the ocean and land in the sediment, so it's way, way down deep, and it's not going to hurt anybody. Well, the problem is that fish and other living things, they think that this stuff is food, and they think it's nutritious, and so they actually eat it. They eat it because their bodies are not designed. Nature doesn't know how to detect radioactivity. Our bodies do not know how to detect radioactivity. We can't smell it. We can't taste it. We can't feel it. None of our senses tell us that something is radioactive. So what happens is the fish and the other animals, they eat this stuff thinking that it's good food, that it's good nutrition. And when the body gets this, this into their stomach, they also, the, bod, the stomach doesn't know it's radioactive, and so it thinks it's good food, and it puts it up. It makes, you know, how, you know how we use food to build our bodies and to get larger and to grow? Well, that's because the, the stuff that we eat is actually incorporated into our bodies. Well, that's what happens with this radioactive material, too. It gets eaten by animals, fish, and so on, and it gets right incorporated into their bodies. Now, if we eat the fish, then we're going to get it into our bodies as well. And so that's the problem with contamination of the food supply, uh, which uh, is a, a real concern. And this is what the Japanese people are struggling with. They're really struggling with how to try and contain this material as much as they can, how to prevent more spillage into the sea. And they're building, by the way, they're spending, they're planning to spend, y your listeners might be interested to know, mm -hmm. that the Japanese government has this amazing idea. It sounds crazy, in fact. But you, everybody knows about ice rinks. You make an ice rink to make hockey, right? Mm -hmm. And you can use a, you can, even in a hot climate, even in a place like down in the southern United States where it's quite hot outside, you can still make ice. And you can make a nice ice rink. Well, they want to make an ice wall, a, a huge wall, under the ground. They want to make an underground ice wall all the way around these six reactors. That means that this wall would be enormous, uh, and it would surround all of the reactors. And the reason for this idea of building an ice wall around the reactors would be to prevent the water that's flowing under the reactors, the water that I was just talking about, the groundwater, mm -hmm. It would be to prevent that water from, from uh, coming in contact with the radioactive cores of the reactors and therefore preventing the pollution, uh, the continuing pollution of the Pacific Ocean. So that's what they're planning to do, but it's going to take them about two years to do it. It's going to take about a thousand million dollars. That's a billion dollars. In case people don't know, a, a thousand million is a billion. And uh, so that's a huge amount of money. And also, they're going to have to keep the ice frozen, and that means they're going to have to keep using energy all the time just to, keep, just to keep that ice wall frozen. And on top of all this, people are not entirely sure that that is going to work. They, they, they hope it's going to work, but they're not sure it's going to work. So you can understand then that when these reactors are functioning nicely, when they function nicely and there's no problem and there's no accident, they look like really nice machines. They're producing electricity. They're humming along. They look great. And uh, the workers inside are quite happy because they don't, uh, they don't have to breathe the dangerous stuff normally while they're working because they're well looked after. But when you have an accident, all that stuff goes out the window. And then you have a problem not just for, not just for one year, but they're expecting that it's going to take them at least 40 years to put this accident at Fukushima, to get this accident under complete control and to get all that radioactive material uh, properly packaged and, and uh, stored somewhere where it cannot be a danger 
to people or to the environment. So 40 years, that's a long time mm -hmm. to work on a, uh, on a single accident. Mm-hmm. And, and here's the thing that uh, bothers me. Um, I have a lot of friends who are pro-nuclear. That is, they like nuclear power. They think it's a wonderful thing. And, and I can understand that. As a matter of fact, when I was in university, I wanted to go into nuclear energy. I wanted to go into nuclear physics because I thought that was a wonderful field, a very interesting. And um, it sounded like a good thing to me. And, uh, but I changed my mind because of two things. And the two things that changed my mind is this danger of the radioactivity and the fact that we don't know how to stop radioactivity. We don't know how to turn it off. And so we have this radioactive waste problem because these radioactive materials that I was just talking about they remain dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Now, you know, the pyramids of Egypt, you know, the oldest thing that most people know about is the pyramids of Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And the pyramids of Egypt, they're only 5,000 years old. 5,000 years is nothing compared with this waste. This waste is, it lasts for, it, it, even, even 100,000 years is not long enough. It, it's more than a million years. In fact, it's 10 million years is not long enough even. So um, what we're doing here is we're creating a problem for future generations that lasts forever, basically, and which uh, uh, it seems like an awfully heavy price to pay for the sake of a little bit of electricity for, for maybe 20 or 30 years. Because from these nuclear reactors, you only get electricity for about 20 or 30 years, maybe 40 if you're lucky. And then all you have is radioactive waste, nothing else. That's all you've got left over. But there's one other thing that really bothers me, and that is that in the waste, when you look at the waste from the reactor, I've told you, of course, about how dangerous it is mm -hmm. because of all these radioactive materials. But it turns out there's one particular material in the waste which is not a fission product. It's not a broken piece of uranium atom. It's an atom which is heavier than uranium. Now, that's a strange thing because uranium is the heaviest atom that you can find in nature. There isn't any heavier atom in nature. However, inside the reactor, what happens is that there are these things called neutrons. They're little tiny, like they're little tiny bullets. You can think of them as little tiny bullets. And it's these little tiny bullets that are splitting the atoms, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, when a neutron hits a uranium atom, it can cause it to split. But sometimes the bullet, instead of splitting the atom, it just gets stuck in the atom and makes the atom a little bit heavier. And that way we get a new substance which is heavier than uranium, and it's called plutonium. And so plutonium is a man-made element or human-made element. It's something which is made inside every nuclear reactor because while we're trying to split the uranium atoms to get, to get uh, energy, some of the uranium atoms are slowly turning into plutonium atoms. Now, the reason this is bad is because plutonium is the primary nuclear explosive in nuclear weapons. So when, they, when you look at the nuclear weapons, I mentioned earlier there's thousands of nuclear weapons in the world. Well, those nuclear weapons all use plutonium. As I was saying, one of these uh, problems with the nuclear reactors, like the Fukushima reactors, is these radioactive materials in the waste remain dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years. And that's a real problem because, you know, do we have a right to just generate a bit of electricity for our use for 10 or 20 or maybe 30 or 40 years at most. And then we leave a problem to our great, great, great grandchildren uh, that uh, we ourselves do not know how to get rid of this problem and they probably won't know how either. But it doesn't seem fair to create this problem for them and to just walk away from it, which is what uh, the industry is hoping to do. They really want to bury it in the ground somewhere and then just forget it, walk away. We think that that's uh, irresponsible. We think that we can't just walk away from this waste. We have to guard it carefully. One of the reasons we have to guard it carefully is because it's not all waste in the sense of just being dangerous because of radioactivity. It turns out that there's one of the materials in the waste called plutonium. And plutonium does not exist in nature. It's created inside every nuclear reactor. And how does this happen? Well, inside the reactor, as I told you before, the atoms of uranium are being split. But they're being split by little tiny particles called neutrons, which travel very fast. 
And you can think of these neutrons as being like little bullets. And these bullets, when they hit a uranium atom, they usually split it and release this energy, which we call nuclear energy. But sometimes when the neutron hits the uranium atom, it doesn't split. It just simply merges with the uranium atom and makes the uranium atom a little bit heavier. And what we get is an atom that is heavier than uranium. And that's strange because in nature, the heaviest atom is uranium. There isn't anything heavier. So what we've done here is we've created a brand new element. It's a man-made element, a human-made element called plutonium. And what's dangerous about this is that plutonium turns out to be a, ter whether you call it a wonderful or a terrible nuclear explosive, it turns out it's one of the most powerful nuclear explosives in the entire world. So that when you look at these thousands of nuclear weapons that I was talking about before, it turns out that the principal nuclear explosive material in all of those bombs is plutonium. Uh, and that plutonium is man-made, and it's made inside nuclear reactors. And it doesn't matter whether the reactor is being used to generate electricity or whether the reactor is being used for some other purpose. It doesn't matter. As long as uranium atoms are being split, there's going to be a certain amount of plutonium that is being created at the same time. Now, Plutonium is chemically different from all the other materials, all those radioactive poisons I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, you can use chemistry to separate it from the other stuff. And when you separate the plutonium, you have pure plutonium. That plutonium is a very powerful nuclear explosive. And anybody can use that plutonium to make a very powerful atomic bomb. Now, plutonium, once it's made, it doesn't disappear very quickly. In fact, it has a half-life of 24,000 years. What that means is that only after 24,000 years will half of the plutonium be gone, and there'll still be half of it left. So you know what that means. That means that thousands of years from now, somebody could come to a place where there used to be a nuclear reactor, and, but, but the nuclear reactor has been shut down for centuries, and there's no electricity being generated, they can dig up the nuclear waste and take the plutonium out of the nuclear waste and use that plutonium to make atomic bombs. So uh, this, I think, is a terrible legacy for the future because it means instead of developing the world towards a peaceful place where bombs are done away with and armies are a thing of the past, you know, we no longer allow cannibalism. People don't go around eating each other. We no longer allow duels. You know, in the 19th and 18th century, people would go outside men. They would fight each other to the death. They would shoot each other until one of them was dead. And it was considered legal, and it was considered uh, a matter of honor to go out and fight to the death over some silly argument. Well, that's not allowed anymore. We, we've done away with dueling. Uh, in the United States, there used to be slavery. We've done away with slavery. Well, at some time in the future, and I hope it's sooner rather than later, we have to do away with war. We have to do away with armies. We have to do away with weapons because we're getting to the point with these nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction where all we're doing is killing ourselves. We're making the planet uninhabitable for what? For just because of some silly argument, basically, just because of some disagreement. It may not be a silly argument. It may be a serious argument, but there's no reason to destroy the planet for that reason. As we said earlier, uh, as Chris Hatfield said from outer space, the Earth is like a spaceship, and we're all the crew of this spaceship, and we have to work together to make the world safer, not more dangerous. We have to make it cleaner, not dirtier. We have to save ourselves by saving all the other species of plants and animals mm -hmm. as well. So we really have to start thinking differently. We have to grow up and realize that this is not the way to go. Well, the difficulty of having a technology like nuclear power that produces a nuclear explosive material, and once it's produced, we don't know how to get rid of it, and it's going to be around for thousands of years. This just seems like a, a dumb thing to do. And uh, no matter how appealing nuclear power might look like from the outside, once you delve into it, you realize that the problems that it poses, the problems that it brings with it, are really, really serious problems. I would like to talk about World War II. Just say if nuclear plants existed back then, would Europe be a place where you could live in today? 
Well, that's a, that's a, a question that was actually addressed by a nuclear physicist from Britain. His name was Sir Brian Flowers, and he, he was a British scientist who worked on the nuclear weapons of, you know, Britain has its own nuclear weapons. They developed their own nuclear weapons, and he worked on the nuclear weapons, and he also worked in the nuclear power program. And then uh, the government of Britain asked him, Sir Brian Flowers, to do an investigation into nuclear power and the environment. And he wrote a wonderful report, which I read a long time ago, because the report was issued in 1974, long, long time ago. But I read this report when it came out, and boy, it was really interesting. One of the things he said is that if nuclear power had been developed before World War II, if Germany and France and Britain and uh, Belgium and all those other countries, if they had developed nuclear power and had a whole bunch of nuclear power plants running, then because of World War II, when you know there was terrible destruction during World War II, everything was bombed. Uh, whole cities were bombed and, and all kinds of bridges and railroad tracks and, and uh, munitions dumps, everything was bombed. Well, he said that if nuclear power had been around then, large parts of Europe would be completely uninhabitable today because those nuclear power plants would have been targeted by sabotage and by uh, bombardment from the air and they would have been destroyed. And when those plants are destroyed, all the radioactive junk inside is released. And that stuff goes into the environment, and the environment becomes unlivable. And uh, he said that just, and, and that was a sobering thought to me, because I had never thought about that before. And it's a sobering thought today. Just imagine if nuclear power plants were all over the world, in every country in the world, then anywhere there's conflict, anywhere there's a, 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 some kind of a war going on, um, these things would probably be bombed. And if they were bombed, they would release all those contents, and that would make large areas of land completely uninhabitable for a long period of time. You know, in the Ukraine, there was a reactor called the Chernobyl reactor, Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Chernobyl reactor uh, had an accident about, more, about 28 years ago. 28 years ago. That's a long time. That's probably a lot longer than many of your listeners have lived. Uh, well, the radioactivity from that reactor accident are still there today. In fact, the, the, oh, the whole area around that reactor is a no-man's land. Nobody can go in there. And, in fact, it's against the law. If anybody enters, they can be arrested and put into prison. Um, and they've also found that the soil in the area of this reactor is still contaminated radioactively in the first three centimeters of soil. If you just if you just look at the first three centimeters of soil from the top, um, there's a lot of radioactive contamination there. They were worried just the other just a couple of years ago there were a bunch of wildfires in the area, and they were afraid that these wildfires would burn the grass and spread clouds of radioactive smoke into the air, and which would cause more problems for the people living further away. So. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Up until two years ago, and this is something that many people don't realize, up until two years ago, even if you look at England, now if, if, you, if, if people look on a map and see how far it is from Kiev, which is in the Ukraine, not very far from Chernobyl, if you look at the distance from Kiev to England, to northern England, it's a long way. And yet in northern England, up until two years ago, the sheep farmers could not sell their sheep for, for human consumption. They couldn't sell lamb meat or mutton for human consumption. Why? Because the sheep were being contaminated by radioactivity that they got from eating the grass. And the grass was radioactive because the soil was radioactive. And wh when you grow grass in radioactive soil, the grass sucks the radioactivity up into the grass. And where did the soil get contaminated from? From the Chernobyl accident 28 years earlier. So the consequences of these accidents are very long-lived. And that's what Sir Brian Flowers was talking about. He was saying, look, if you had not just one reactor being blown up, but if you had dozens of reactors being blown up all over Europe, then large parts of Europe would be simply uninhabitable.
That, that's sad to hear. Since we're Canadians, I'd like to talk about the Quebec Agreement, which happened in August 19, 1943, during World War II by Prime Minister Mackenzie King, Winston Churchill, and President Roosevelt. Yes, well, um, that was a... In 1942, there was actually a meeting here in Quebec City uh, on the St. Lawrence River, um, and uh, uh, this was during World War II. You know, World War II began in 1939, from our point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the year when Poland was invaded, and uh, that was the year when Britain finally declared war on, on Germany. And uh, it wasn't until a couple of years later that uh, the USA, the Americas, got involved. Although Canada was involved from the beginning, because we were involved as allies of Britain. The United States took another couple of years. It was not until the bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese that the United States got involved. Well, during this period of time, surprisingly enough, it was just at the outbreak of war in 1939 that it was discovered that you could get an enormous amount of energy by splitting uranium atoms. And guess where that discovery was made? Mm -hmm. It was made in Berlin, which is the capital of Germany. Mm -hmm. So it was right under Adolf Hitler's nose that this discovery was made that you could get an enormous amount of energy by splitting uranium atoms. So researchers in France and researchers in England very quickly realized that you might be able to make a very powerful, a very, very powerful bomb by splitting uranium atoms. And that's where the idea of the atomic bomb began. But what they needed for this was they needed to have uranium. And where in the world could you find uranium? Well, it turns out that uh, the best source of uranium that people knew about was in, uh, was in uh, uh, Switzerland. No, excuse me, not in Switzerland. I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Uh, Czechoslovakia, that's what I was, I meant Czechoslovakia, not Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia. Well, that's where the main source of uranium was in the world, and that's where, that's where Marie Curie got her uranium. She's the one who discovered... Uh, she won two Nobel Prizes for investigating radioactivity and the radioactivity of uranium. Well, she got her uranium from Czechoslovakia. Well, guess, guess who took over Czechoslovakia? Mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler. The Germans took over Czechoslovakia, so they were in control of that. There, there was one other place where they had a lot of uranium, and that was down in the Belgian Congo, what we call the Congo now, the Republic of Congo. And guess who had taken over Belgium? Adolf Hitler and the Nazis had taken over Belgium. So it seemed that all the uranium supplies in Europe were controlled by the Germans, and they were not accessible to the French or the British or the Americans. So they turned their attention to the only other place where they knew that there was uranium, and that was Canada. And it turns out that, that in the 1930s, about 10 years before war started, there was a, an, an Ontario geologist named Gilbert Labine. Uh, my mother actually knew his mother. <laughs> Really? And Gilbert Labine and his brother, they started a company called Eldorado Gold Mining Company. And they heard about way, way up in the north, way, way up near the Arctic Circle on the, on the uh, shore of Great Bear Lake. If you look on the map, you'll see how, high, how far north Great Bear Lake is. It's a huge lake way, way up there. Mm -hmm. And they discovered up there radioactivity. And that radioactivity was because of a uranium deposit, a very rich uranium deposit. And it was the only really large uranium deposit in the world outside of the ones in Czechoslovakia and the Belgian Congo. So they said, the Americans and the British said, we got to get Canada involved in this. And so they had a meeting in Quebec City, President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of Britain at the time, and uh, Mackenzie King, who was the Prime Minister of Canada. And they signed an agreement called the Quebec Accord. And this Quebec Accord was an agreement to cooperate together, it was a top secret agreement, to cooperate together in building the world's first atomic bombs using Canadian uranium, using British know-how, because they had a lot of the scientific know-how, and using the Americans' know-how and the American laboratories to develop the world's first atomic bomb. So the, these three countries entered into this agreement, and they, they made a promise, uh, they wrote down a promise on the agreement that they would not use this weapon against each other, and that they would also not use it against any other country without unanimous agreement of those three countries together. 
So this meant that when the bombs were dropped in 1945 on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Canada had to give its permission for that because we were one of the parties to the, uh, to the Quebec Agreement. And that was one of the conditions, is we had to have unanimous agreement. As a matter of fact, our Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, after the bombing of Hiroshima, he gave a press conference in Ottawa, and he announced that the Canadian government was very proud to have participated in this a wonderful scientific discovery. And he didn't mention anything about the hundreds of thousands of people who had been killed and maimed by the bomb. Uh, he was just proud of the fact that Canada played a role in it. Of course, you have to understand that people were very happy that the World War II was over. And so from the point of view, it was a relief to think that all of this terrible warfare was, was finally coming to an end. Nevertheless, there were a lot of ordinary people uh, who were absolutely horrified at the idea of using... You see, it's not just a question of blowing up soldiers. It's a question of blowing up an entire city full of women, children, and infants, children and mothers. And uh, you ask yourself, well, isn't that, I mean, we talk about terrorism. I mean, if that's not terrorism, what is, you know? <laughs> so talk about killing, uh, killing innocent people. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, that was where Canada first got involved in nuclear energy, really, was uh, through participation in the World War II atomic bomb project. And uh, what they did was they had, a, they had a secret laboratory right here in Montreal, where I live, on the slopes of Mount Royal, uh, where the University of Montreal is now located, they had a secret laboratory up there. And uh, scientists, not only from Canada, but there were actually scientists from Britain, from France, and from several European countries who came to Canada and worked in this secret laboratory up on Mount Royal. And in 1944, that was a full year before the bombs were actually used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in 1944, a decision was made uh, in Washington, D.C. to build Canada's first nuclear reactor. And so the decision to build Canada's first nuclear reactor was a wartime decision, and that was building a reactor at a place called Chalk River, Ontario, north of Ottawa. It's on the Ottawa River. And the, they have a plaque there. If you, if, you visit the, if you go to the visitor center, they have a big bronze plaque outside the visitor center, and it says that this is where... Canada's first nuclear reactor was built, and uh, it was originally designed to produce plutonium for bombs. It was part of the it was part of the bomb program. And as a matter of fact, for the next for the next many years, Canada Canada developed the uranium industry in Canada became the largest in the world. We had dozens of mines opening up all over Canada after the war. And all of that uranium from 1945 all the way up into 1965, all of that uranium was sold to the American military for the precise purpose of building nuclear weapons. That's all it was for, nothing else. And also at Chalk River, where we had our first nuclear reactors, they were producing plutonium in the waste. You know, as they produced the waste, they also produced plutonium. And that plutonium was also sold to the United States for bombs also. So Canada, for the first 20 or so years after the World War II, actually was in the business of selling nuclear materials for bombs. And there were no real peaceful applications of nuclear power until later. Later on, because in those days, in the early days, the only nuclear reactors were really ones that were producing plutonium for bombs. That was it. In fact, they built the first reactors in the United States were built out in Washington State, uh, just way out on the on the west coast, and um, uh, along the uh, it, it's called the Hanford site, Hanford, and uh, at Hanford they built several reactors that, whose only job was to produce plutonium for bombs. That was it. They didn't produce any electricity, but at a certain point they said to themselves, "Hey, you know, while we produce the plutonium for bombs, we're also producing an awful lot of waste heat." because they had to cool these reactors to prevent them from melting down like the Fukushima reactors, right? So they had to cool them with a lot of water, a lot of water all the time, cooling through the, through the reactor core. They said, you know, there's an awful lot of heat. So since we're producing plutonium anyway, why don't we use the waste heat to produce electricity? And so the idea 
was to take these plutonium producing plants and produce electricity as a byproduct. And that's where the electricity producing so that's where the electricity producing reactors came from. They really came from this original design for to produce plutonium for bombs. And when the first reactor was built in Canada, um, it, the decision to build it was made in 1944. That, that was while the war was still on. And that decision was made in Washington, D.C. It was a military decision. And the decision was to build a reactor in Canada at Chalk River, Ontario, in order to produce plutonium for bombs. And uh, if you go to Chalk River today, they have a visitor center, and they have a great big bronze plaque, which anybody can read, uh, which is on our website too, which is www.ccnr.org. And on that website, we have the text of this plaque, which says that the first Canadian reactor was built to produce plutonium for bombs. It was part of the American bomb program. Um, so not only did we build the first reactor for that purpose, but uh, for the next 20 years, from 1945 to 1975, uh, we opened up a lot of uranium mines in Canada. There, there was, Canada was the world's largest producer of uranium, and we had dozens of uranium mines opening up, uh, mostly in northern Canada and northern Saskatchewan, northern Ontario. And... Um, all of the uranium that was come out of those mines was sold to the Americans specifically for building bombs. So building bombs was the main market for uranium. Also at Chalk River, we had uh, research reactors which did not produce plutonium, which did not produce electricity, but which did produce plutonium. And that plutonium was also sold to the Americans for bombs in order to help finance Canada's. Uh, uh, expenses in uh, doing nuclear research. So, so we sell the plutonium for bombs and we continue doing research uh, while the uh, Chalk River scientists were trying to develop various peaceful applications of nuclear power, not only nuclear electricity generation, but also developing other types of radioactive substances that could be used in medicine and in industry. Um, uh, these are called radioisotopes, uh, radioactive materials which have a a useful role in uh, medicine and industry. Uh, just to give you an example, one of the things that they produce at Chalk River today is a substance called technetium-99. Actually, it's called technetium-99-M, where M stands for metastable. And this stuff is used in hospitals. They give a patient a, a drink which contains this radioactive material. The radioactive material goes through his body, uh, her body, and uh, it kind of uh, makes all of the internal organs give off radioactivity, give off radiation. And what they can do then is they can take a picture of the insides of a, of a patient and get a very good picture of what the internal organs look like. And it turns out that this technetium 99M only has a half-life of six hours, which means that it's gone in a matter of days and uh, it doesn't have any lasting effect. And uh, for that reason, uh, that this is a, a useful application in hospitals. Uh, unfortunately, there is a byproduct which it does produce, which has a half-life of 210,000 years. Uh, but uh, most of the people in the, in the medical field, they don't even understand that that's a problem. But anyway, uh, many of these radioisotopes are not as trouble-free as they first seem. But getting back to the main point, the main point is that Canada built up its nuclear industry. First of all, it was the government of Canada that did it. It was not private industry. This was not private business investing in these things. It was the government of Canada that created the nuclear industry in Canada. Uh, and uh, they also created the uranium industry. And for the first 20 years or so, the main product was really for the military and for building bombs. Uh, now, in 1965, the Canadian government made a declaration. They said that we will no longer sell uranium for, for military purposes, and we will no longer sell any of our nuclear technology for military purposes. So since 1965 until the present, the official Canadian policy is that our technology and our uranium is really to be sold for peaceful purposes only. But there's a problem. The problem is that you can use the uranium for peaceful purposes and then turn around and use the remainders for bombs. 
Uh, that's what India did, for example, in 1974. That was just one year before, uh, well, no, 1974, that was almost 10 years after this new policy about peaceful use. In 1974, India, uh, we gave a nuclear reactor to India as a gift. It was a research reactor. And India used that research reactor like, the, like it was intended for research. But they also took the plutonium that was produced by that reactor and they used it to build their first atomic bomb. And they exploded that bomb in 1974. And Canada all of a sudden was shocked into realizing that you really can't separate the peaceful atom from the military atom. That you can use uranium for peaceful purposes but because the uranium is turning into plutonium, you can then turn around and use the plutonium for bombs. So uh, that's the problem even today. Even to this day, we have to ask ourselves, uh, how do we have peaceful nuclear energy without also contributing to the spread of nuclear weapons? And we haven't figured that one out yet. And it's one of the main reasons why I remain opposed to nuclear power, simply because the problems have not been solved. If they had solved the problems, if they knew how to get rid of the nuclear waste once and for all safely, if they knew how to prevent the possibility of a catastrophic meltdown accident, if they knew how to prevent, absolutely prevent, nuclear materials from being used in nuclear weapons, then nuclear power would be worth a second look. However, uh, as long as those problems remain unsolved, I think we have to stamp it uh, as uh, immature technology. This technology is, is not, it hasn't been digested, it hasn't been uh, developed to a safe point and therefore it shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. How many nuclear reactors do we have in Canada? One is not too far from where I live, and that would be Pickering. How safe are they? Well, uh, the, that's a debatable point, how safe they are. Uh, we've been so far lucky in Canada in that we have only had uh, uh, a couple of nuclear accidents. We had one in 1952 and one in 1958. But they were both at Chalk River, and they only involved very small nuclear reactors, not the great big ones that we have uh, for electricity production. Um, however, uh, those were pretty serious accidents, especially the 1952 one. In 1952, the, the, the first uh, research reactor that was built there was called the NRX reactor, NRX, and it exploded and underwent a series of hydrogen gas explosions and actually had a partial core meltdown. And they, they, had to, uh, they had a very, very scary episode there. And the only reason that uh, it didn't uh, ruin the entire uh, Ottawa Valley is because the reactor was so small that uh, the, there wasn't nearly as much radioactivity there as you find in a modern research reactor or a modern electricity-producing reactor that would have tons more radioactivity than you have in this little plant. Nevertheless, um, there were a lot of people who were involved in the cleanup, about 600 people. One of the people involved in the cleanup of that reactor, it turns out, was a young man called Jimmy Carter, who later became president of the United States. And at that time, he was a, a Navy. He was in the US Navy, and he was working on a nuclear submarine. And in order to clean up after that accident in 1952, uh, they sent uh, a lot of U.S. military people to Chalk River to get experience in cleaning up a radioactive mess. And uh, that's, I think, why Jimmy Carter, years, years later, when he became president, uh, it was when he was president that there was a meltdown in the United States called the Three Mile Island Reactor. It melted down in 1979. And, uh, and Jimmy Carter was the first president of the United States that had actually any training in nuclear science and in nuclear engineering. He was a nuclear engineer. And uh, so he knew, he, he knew better than most uh, what was involved in this technology. And he's the one who introduced in the United States a complete ban on what's called plutonium reprocessing. Plutonium reprocessing is a technology whereby you take the used fuel from the reactor, this highly radioactive used fuel, this irradiated fuel, and you dissolve it in acid. You dissolve it in liquid acid in order to be able to chemically separate the plutonium for use as nuclear fuel. Because in order to keep these reactors running in the future, they want to start using plutonium as a fuel. But the problem is plutonium 
can be used as a fuel for reactors, but it can also be used as a nuclear explosive. And what happens when criminals uh, like Tony Soprano gets his hands on some plutonium? Uh, he may not use it himself for nuclear weapons, but he might sell it to somebody who wants to buy it. And the person who wants to buy it might be some terrorist group or some organization that means to build a homemade atomic bomb and blow up a city with it. So it's scary, the idea of having plutonium in circulation. And what Jimmy Carter did, that as President of the United States, he ordered that there would be no plutonium separation in the United States of America for civilian purposes. And uh, that, that ban has lasted right up to the present time. So all the presidents that came after Jimmy Carter have all upheld that ban on plutonium reprocessing, which I'm very happy about. Unfortunately, other countries haven't stuck to that, and other countries are going ahead with reprocessing. For example, France, Japan, Russia, India, and even England, they all have, uh, have engaged in reprocessing. And they have accumulated stockpiles of plutonium, uh, which is a, a danger for world peace, I think, ultimately. So that's the situation today. Jimmy Carter tried to get all the countries in the world to stop reprocessing plutonium, to stop separating plutonium. But uh, unfortunately, they wouldn't really listen to him. And they only listened to him partly. And so they, they, he certainly had a good influence in terms of uh, cutting down on the amount of plutonium in the world. But he didn't solve the problem altogether. You know, our own Prime Minister Trudeau, the earlier Trudeau, not, not Justin, but his, his dad, his dad, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, he gave a talk to the United Nations in 1978 in which he said, you know, everybody who is intelligent in the world, even if they're generals, you, generals in the military or uh, presidents of, of countries, everybody agrees that really we should get rid of nuclear weapons altogether. It's all agreed. In fact, it's even written down in print. They've, they've, they have a non-proliferation treaty, which is signed by almost all the countries in the world in which they agree that they should get rid of all their nuclear weapons. They just haven't done it yet. Now, uh, the thing is that, uh, that uh, what Trudeau said in, in the United Nations in 1978, he said that if you want to get rid of nuclear weapons, you have to have a strategy of suffocation. You have to suffocate the nuclear weapons industry by cutting off the supply of nuclear explosive materials. And he said that means you have to outlaw plutonium separation and you have to outlaw uranium enrichment because it turns out that there's two ways that you can make an atomic bomb. You can either make it using plutonium or you can use it making what's called highly enriched uranium. And right now they're trying to really uh, uh, control and even eliminate highly enriched uranium from the whole world. They're trying to cut back on this. Uh, that's one of the reasons why people are all upset about Iran. You know, Iran is building a uranium enrichment facility, and they are able to enrich uranium. And what people are afraid of is that if you can enrich uranium a little bit, then you can also enrich uranium a lot, and you can enrich it to the point where you can use it as a nuclear explosive also. So uh, plutonium or highly enriched uranium, what Trudeau, what Prime Minister Trudeau said to the United Nations is, if we really want to get rid of nuclear weapons, we have to chop, we have to stop the traffic in these materials. And that means really ultimately the end of nuclear power. He didn't say that, but that's what it does mean. Because you can't keep the nuclear power industry going if you disallow these, two, these materials from being used. Almost all the reactors in Canada are in Ontario. There's 18 reactors currently operating in Ontario because four of them are shut down so there would have been 22. Um, the, the, the four that are shut down are two smaller reactors called the NPD reactor and the Douglas Point reactor. And there's also two of the Pickering reactors have been permanently shut down. And by the way, the other six reactors at Pickering, just outside of Toronto, very close to downtown Toronto, actually, um, those, all of those reactors are going to be shut down within the next five years. So... Uh, those eight reactors are going to be completely gone from Pickering after about five years from now, maybe, maybe sooner. So the, the nuclear industry in Canada is actually shrinking. There hasn't been any new reactors built in Canada since 1978. Imagine a business, imagine any kind of industry where there's no sales for all that length of time since 1978. <laughs> what kind of a business is that? 
So uh, the business is not good. And in fact, that applies all over North America. In North America, there have been almost no reactors built since 1978. There are a few that are under construction, but even the ones that are under construction in the states are in trouble. And there's more reactors being shut down than there are being started up. And that goes worldwide. It turns out that worldwide, there's about 450 reactors, roughly speaking, in the world as a whole. And worldwide, it produces about 16% of all the electricity in the world <coughs> as of the year 2005. In the year 2005, it was producing 16% of the electricity, but now already it's dropped down to about 12%. So it's on the decline. It's actually going down, not up. And nuclear power, there's more nuclear power plants being shut down every year than there are being started up. After the Fukushima accident, G Germany shut down eight of its 17 nuclear reactors right away. And they said, that these are permanently shut down. We're not going to restart these at all. And uh, they have also promised that they will shut down all 17 nuclear reactors in Germany by the year 2020. So things are not looking good for the nuclear industry in terms of new sales. The only place where nuclear power is increasing, or seems to be increasing, is in Russia and in India and uh, in Asia, uh, especially China. Uh, there are new reactors under construction in those countries, and they seem determined to go ahead to build new ones. But in North America, the nuclear industry is virtually at a standstill and is actually going backwards. And in Europe also, it seems to be stalled, and, and the chances of new reactors being built are not very good there either, although they're trying to build some new ones. So I think that right now, in the, at this point of world history, we're at a turning point. I think that if the people of the world, the young people, for example, if young people really get involved in this and make their wishes known and, and make it clear to their political leaders that they don't want nuclear power, now's the time when it can really have an impact because the economics are not good and people, the, the decision makers are beginning to realize that this technology is probably poses much greater problems than it does uh, give advantages. It does give advantages. It does give electricity, and the electricity does not produce greenhouse gases, and that's one of the plus sides of it. The other plus side of it is that it can run 24 hours a day, and uh, it, it, it has a very concentrated form of energy, like the energy in a nuclear reactor is so concentrated that just a single fuel bundle about the size of a, of a, of a fireplace log can produce as much energy as a whole carload of coal. And so the concentration of the energy and the fact that it doesn't produce greenhouse gases, global warming, all of these are plus, pluses for the nuclear industry. But the, on the downside, it turns out to be very, very expensive. And it turns out to be uh, these unsolved problems of uh, connection with nuclear weapons, the nuclear waste, and the danger of these absolutely crippling nuclear accidents like the Fukushima disaster. So when you put it all together, you have to ask yourself, are the advantages worth the risks? And a lot of people are increasingly saying, no, I don't think they are. In Japan, they liked nuclear power. The Japanese people were very supportive of nuclear power. And before the Fukushima accident, they had 54 nuclear reactors in Japan that were producing about 30% of all the electricity in Japan. Well, since the, you know how many reactors are running in Japan today? Zero. There's not one reactor running in Japan. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because the people are against it. And the reason the people are against it is for two reasons. First of all, they've seen the Fukushima disaster and how terrifying it is. But there's a more important reason, and that is that they feel that they've been betrayed. They feel that their political leaders and the people in the nuclear industry have lied to them. Uh, as a matter of fact, the mayor of one of the towns that has been evacuated said that he went from being pro-nuclear to being anti-nuclear overnight because all the time he was mayor of this town, he was told time and time again that this technology was safe, 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 and that there were, never could be a serious accident. And that's just simply a lie. And so he has lost faith. He's lost faith. Once you break trust, it's very hard to reestablish it, you know? And... Uh, so this is why uh, people in Japan are quite angry, uh, which is not the tradition in Japan. In Japan, usually the tradition is to be quite obedient and to listen and respect you know, authorities and so on. 
But the reason they're so angry is because they feel that they have actually been been lied to and misled and that uh, that they've been betrayed. Even two prime ministers, uh, a very popular man who was the prime minister some years ago of Japan, he has come out completely against nuclear power. He says, I don't want Japan to have any nuclear power plants in the future. Even though when, the, when he was prime minister, he was completely supporting nuclear power and was one of the biggest promoters of nuclear power. Also, the man who was prime minister at the time of the accident, was his name was uh, Tan. And uh, Prime Minister Tan has also come out and said, he, he thinks that they should all be shut down. And here's something strange. Uh, even in the United States, and the United States government has not come out against nuclear power at all. They still want to build new reactors. Um, but the man who was the head of the nuclear regulatory agency at the time of the Fukushima accident in the United States, his name was Jasko, and he was the head of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He has come out and said that he thinks that all the reactors in the USA should be shut down because they all have the same problem that the Fukushima reactors have. And what that problem is, is that there's no emergency off switch that will shut the reactor completely down in a totally safe state. There is an off switch. They can shut the reactor off immediately, but they can't shut off the radioactivity. And because they can't shut off the radioactivity, it can still melt down long after it's been shut down. And that's the problem. So he says, uh, you know, how many adventure films have we seen where the hero at the last minute manages to pull a switch or cut a cable and save the world? Because this device that was going to explode is all of a sudden it's safe because you've turned it off, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, you can't do that with a nuclear power plant. You just can't shut it off and walk away from it and feel safe because it's going to melt down all by itself if you walk away from it. Of course, that's what it's going to do. Yeah. Going back to Fukushima disaster and what is happening with the Pacific Ocean, why now sardines are dying? Do you think the fish industry is in trouble? It is, yeah. yeah. Well... You know, this is where we start getting into a lot of debatable areas because if you eat a fish from Fukushima, it's not going to kill you, uh, at least not immediately. And the problem is that when we talk about, uh, when we talk about uh, radiation, we have to t distinguish between what is called high levels of radiation and low levels of radiation. Now, when you have high levels of radiation, um, you can get sick right away and die very quickly. It's called radiation sickness. And your hair falls out and your skin, your skin peels off and, and you have a lot of terrible uh, nausea, vomiting, and so on and so on. And you can be dead within a matter of days or weeks. So that, those are high levels of radiation. Now, the fish are not contaminated to such high degrees, nor is the soil contaminated to such high degrees, it's not the case that people are just going to keel over dead, you know, just because they're standing there or just because they're eating a radioactive fish. That's not the case because the levels of radioactivity are much, much lower, much too low to cause that kind of immediate radiation sickness. But what happens is that as this stuff gets incorporated into your body, um, you get damage inside your body going on that's invisible damage. You can't see it. And even if you went to the doctor, the doctor wouldn't be able to see it either. But what happens is that years later, and I'm talking about usually at least five years later, and sometimes as long as 20 years later, you start seeing an increase in cancer among these people who have been exposed. So, and it, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to get cancer either. It just means that there's going to be a lot of people who do get cancer who wouldn't have otherwise got cancer. And the reason for this is because the radioactivity has damaged their cells inside their body in such a way that some of those cells are able to reproduce, even though they're damaged. And when you have a damaged cell that's reproducing, it means that it doesn't really have the right genetic instructions. It doesn't have the right DNA. And because of that, it starts producing a colony of, um, you might call them, uh, it's kind of a, a they're sort of like rogue cells. They're cells that have gone wild. They're cells that aren't really, they, they forget the fact that they're supposed to be lung cells or skin cells or kidney cells, and they just start becoming a colony of cells of their own type. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's cancer. That's what cancer is. Cancer is when your own cells 
start growing in the wrong way, and you get these what are called cancerous growths, and they have to either cut them out or burn them out or poison them out because they're going to kill you if, if they don't remove them. And so that's what cancer is. And unfortunately, if you're exposed, if, if a large population is exposed to a diet of radioactively contaminated food, then some of those people are going to get cancer, not all of them. And those cancers are called radiogenic cancers or radiation-induced cancers. Well, um, this isn't going to mean the end of the human race or anything. It's not going to mean the, the, the death of the whole J uh, Japanese population, but it's definitely unhealthy. So what happens is they have to try and decide, well, what is supposed to be a quote-unquote safe level? And it turns out that all the science we have shows us that there isn't any really safe level. There is no safe level. Just like there's no safe level of asbestos, people might have heard about the dangers of asbestos. Breathing asbestos, you can get very serious diseases with this. Well, asbestos is so dangerous that they have banned it altogether. They've banned it altogether. They can't use asbestos anymore because it's just too darn dangerous. And it's dangerous at all levels of exposure, even at the lowest levels. Uh, same thing goes with radiation, and by the way, the same thing goes with secondhand smoke. One of the reasons they've done away with smoking in public places is because secondhand smoke, firsthand smoke as well as secondhand smoke, can cause cancer, and there's no safe level. Well, the same thing goes with radioactive contamination. There's really no safe level, so what the authorities do is they set a level which they consider to be permissible. And they call it safe, but it's not really safe. It just means that they are prepared to accept that some people are going to get cancer from this, but, uh, you know, above this level, they're going to say you can't eat the fish. But below this level, they allow people to eat it. So, yeah, you do have this problem of the fish being contaminated, and right now they're not contaminated. Most of them are not contaminated to an extremely high degree, and most of them actually are below what are considered to be the allowable limits. But even that doesn't mean it's exactly safe. So people are going to get this. A man from uh, a journalist who did some good work on this uh, wrote it up in the Georgia Strait newspaper out in Vancouver. He pointed out that uh, just using the figures that Japan has already released about the contamination of the fish, you can be quite sure that there's going to be at least 600 people who are going to get cancer from eating the fish. Um, now, that's not a huge amount of people. But, you know, it's sort of like saying that a certain amount of uh, human sacrifices are acceptable. And people have difficulty with this. They say, well, you know, we shouldn't be poisoning our environment anyway. The difficulty with the Japanese situation is that it's already poisoned. So what are you going to do? You just have to live with it. And either you have to say, well, what I would do myself is I would be very careful to keep an eye on where your, where your food is coming from. And some of that food may be a lot more contaminated than other food. So right now is not a good time to eat sushi if it comes from Japan or, you know, to, to eat certain foods that might be coming from Japan. And, of course, since radiation and pollutants don't know any boundaries, this stuff does work its way across the Pacific Ocean. It does work its way through the food chain. But... Um, there's no way you can avoid it altogether, but you can certainly take precautions. One of the things, for example, during the accident, I, I thought that uh, the Japanese authorities should have been telling women who had children, you know, young children, and women who were pregnant, and women who had nursing, who were nursing their babies, that the important thing at that point in the early stages of a nuclear accident is not to give them fresh milk, but to give them like powdered milk, for example, if you've, if you've got powdered milk that has been on the shelf and that was made before the accident, then it's not going to be radioactively contaminated. And so that milk is going to be safer to use. It may not be as appetizing, but it's going to be safer to use than the fresh milk because in the fresh milk you get radioactive iodine, and radioactive iodine is very dangerous for young children. It sure is. So those are the things that, you know, like people should be getting... What I think is that people should be getting practical advice as to what to look out for in their food and how to, how to buy their food in such a way as to minimize the dangers as much as you can. You can't avoid them altogether. And I don't think that people should be panicky about it in the sense that they think that if I eat this, I'm going to die. There is, I have to say, there is a chance that that could happen, but 
it's not a the chances in an in, in any individual case the chances are quite small so you are probably not going to die but somebody probably is going to die from eating that food and so uh, there's no way of knowing it's almost like i call it sometimes a reverse lottery you know when people buy lottery tickets the chances of them winning the lottery are very small but you know somebody does win and the same thing with the cancer is that the chances of people getting cancer are small, but somebody's going to get it. Yeah, for sure. Somebody is going to get it. Yeah, so it's a, it's a kind of a reverse lottery. And as you increase the radioactive contamination, your chances of getting it go up. And in fact, if you double the amount of radioactivity, then you double your chances. Mm-hmm. Can cigarette smoking diseases be caused by radioactive ingredients? Well, that's, an, that's a very interesting question. You've obviously done your homework. You're right. Uh, smoking is, kills a lot of people. There's an awful lot of people who die. Uh, ten times as many people die from lung cancer who are smokers than people who are not smokers. Ten times more people die from lung cancer. But also what many people don't realize is that lung, people who smoke also have a much higher incidence of heart disease, like heart attacks, and strokes, you know what strokes are, right? They're, they're kind of like a blood clot goes, gets caught in your brain and you get paralyzed. And sometimes you can't even speak and sometimes you can't even move your, uh, all you can move is blink your eyelids. Uh, well, these diseases are also caused by smoking. And for a long time, they didn't know exactly what was causing this, uh, these problems. Uh, but they assumed that it was chemicals. There's a lot of chemicals in the cigarettes. And certainly some of these chemicals are quite capable of causing these disease, some of these diseases. But they've discovered recently, in the last 20 years, they've discovered that there's a radioactive substance which is in the tobacco called polonium-210. And polonium-210 is one of the most dangerous substances on the whole face of the Earth. In fact, this radioactive material, polonium-210, According to the Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory down in the States, that's where they first developed the atomic bomb down there, where they built the first atomic bomb. Um, they, they have on their website uh, a description of polonium-210. And they say this material is 250 billion times more toxic than cyanide. Cyanide is a poison, a very fast-acting poison that occurs in many mystery stories. If you want to kill somebody with poison, cyanide is one of the best things. I, I don't recommend it, mind you. But um, polonium-210 is 250 billion times more toxic. That's almost impossible to imagine. But what it really means, what it translates into, is that if you took a single amount of polonium-210 that was about the size of a small grain of sugar, just imagine the smallest grain of sugar you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. If that was made of polonium-210, that would be enough to kill over a thousand people. And when I say kill, I mean not by cancer, but, but to kill them within, within a matter of weeks. Okay? Because uh, it would give them a very high dose of radiation that would kill them within a matter of uh, a couple of weeks maybe. Uh, so this is very dangerous material, and it turns out that extremely small quantities of this material find their way into tobacco. And when they harvest the tobacco and they put it on the shelf and people buy their cigarettes, they're actually buying inside those cigarettes there's tiny, tiny little amounts of polonium-210. And when they smoke the cigarette, that polonium-210 goes into their lungs and, cause, and, and it contributes greatly to causing lung cancer. But also, it goes into the blood, because you know what the lungs are for, right? The lungs are there to oxygenate the blood. That's what they're there for. Okay. So what happens is the blood comes from your heart, and it goes, first of all, to the lungs so that the blood can get oxygen, and then it goes to the brain, and then it goes to the rest of the body in order to give the oxygen to the cells. It's, it's, the blood is really a delivery system for oxygen. It's a way of delivering oxygen to all the cells of your body. Well... It turns out that this polonium-210 goes right across the lungs into the blood and gets carried right through the whole body. And it, it's that polonium-210 that is responsible for a lot of the heart disease and the strokes that occur. It turns out that when they do autopsies of smokers who have died and they, they examine the blood vessels, 
they find that right where the blood vessel, you know, the blood vessels, they have valves. They're like pipes, right? They have little pipes, but they're like, they have little valves where, for the blood to flow through. And right where those valves are, they find that there's an accumulation of stuff called plaque. And it's that accumulation of plaque that causes the heart disease and the strokes. When they examine the plaque, they find it has alpha radioactivity in it. And that alpha radioactivity is from the polonium-210. And that's the one that really causes all the problems. Because that plaque wouldn't even be there in the first place or it wasn't for the polonium-210. The polonium-210 injures the tissue. It causes a kind of, think about a bruise on your skin. You know, if you get like an injury on your hand, you get a scab, right? Well, inside your blood vessels, the polonium-210, the radiation injures the blood vessel and causes the formation of a kind of, it's called fibrosis. It's, it's a fibrous tissue. It's, it's sort of like scar tissue. And that scar tissue helps to accumulate the plaque, and that accumulation of plaque is what leads to the heart disease and to the strokes. So this is the strange way that radioactivity operates. It, it operates in such a subtle way inside your body that you don't even know what's happening to you. And, you know, one of the reasons why cigarettes were not considered dangerous when I was a kid is because all these movie stars smoke cigarettes and they look glamorous, you know. And by the way, I smoked myself. Uh, I smoked when I started smoking when I was 12 years old, and I, I didn't quit until I was in my 30s uh, because I didn't know any better. I thought it was just fun. I didn't know it was dangerous. Um, but the reason people thought cigarette smoking was okay is because nobody noticed that when somebody smokes a cigarette, they don't fall over dead. So they say, well, cigarette smoking, they look happy. They look smiling. They're laughing. They're having a good time. They're maybe having a drink. They're chatting away with their friends, and they're enjoying their cigarette. So the fact that nobody was visibly dying from cigarettes meant that everybody was fooled into thinking that it was more or less safe. But then they started looking at the statistics in the hospitals, and they started finding out that, my God, there were, in the United States alone, there were more than 250,000 people every year who were dying from cigarette smoking. So uh, that's when people really turned around and started campaigning against tobacco. But the real thing that's causing most of the damage, according to the, there's a society called the Health Physics Society. Now, health physics is a funny word, but actually the people in the Health Physics Society, they study the f effects of radiation. That's what they deal with. So the health physics is the same thing. You might say that health physics is the same thing as a radiation scientist. And what the Health Physics Society says is that 90% of the deaths that are attributed to tobacco are actually caused by polonium-210. So that means if there's 250,000 people dying every year from smoking, 90% of those are being killed by this radioactive material, polonium-210. That's the problem with radioactivity. That is the problem. It's causing a lot of harm. It's causing a lot of harm. It's contributing to um, a very unhealthy situation. I mean, it means that you're living in an unhealthy environment. It is so sad that kids like myself are living in an unhealthy environment, and it is sad that the future generations are going to be affected by this. Right. <laughs> in some areas of Canada, they're bringing a bylaw where we will be unable to use wood fireplaces and yet a nuclear reactor that can cause billions of times more damage to the environment is allowed? How silly is that? We need to actually keep a public that nuclear reactors are the ones that are a great risk to the environment. Well, yeah, I think so. Um, now, uh, the people who pass these kind of laws, I mean, they, they mean well, of course. They're trying to protect people from, because there are things that are in the cigarette smoke, uh, that, excuse me, that are in the wood smoke that are dangerous to the environment. Uh, but um, they neglect the fact, and I think that it's really because the people who are elected to, politi to political office, the people who are members of parliament, and even the people who are prime ministers, they're generally not very scientifically educated. They're not really scientists. They're mostly lawyers. Uh, they could be medical doctors in a couple of cases, uh, but most of them are not scientifically trained. And so what happens is they take their advice from people in their departments who are there to advise them, you know, to tell them, okay, how do I understand what to do about this? And then they get advice. Well, the people who are the advisors are mostly from the nuclear industry. So they already have an interest in nuclear power, 
And it, it's just as if you were getting advice about smoking, whether smoking was harmful or not, if you were getting advice from the tobacco companies. Do you think you'd be getting good advice? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe you should have advice from people who are not from the tobacco companies if you want to know about the dangers of, of cigarette smoking. In a similar way, if you want to know about the dangers of nuclear power, don't ask the people who are in the nuclear industry. It's not because they're bad people, but it's because they have a certain point of view, and their point of view is not the same as, as uh, the public health point of view. You should be asking people who are only concerned about the public health, and then you might be getting better answers. So I think that part of the problem here is that our leaders, our political leaders, are largely either unaware or uh, not well informed or not well not understanding very well what the problem is, partly because they're getting bad advice. And this is a situation where ordinary citizens can play a very important role. You know, the only reason the environment is now being considered uh, more so than it used to be, uh, not so much by our present Canadian government, I must say, because the present Canadian government seems to be going against the interests of protect, pre protecting the environment. But for, for, from the time of, of the 19th century, you could say, we're certainly a lot further ahead in understanding the need to protect the environment today. But you know, the reason for that understanding is because of ordinary citizens. It's because of ordinary citizens uh, lobbying and writing letters and, and expressing their concern about the environment that this has become a political issue. And the only way that you can get leadership on this issue of the environment is if citizens become involved and speak up loudly. As a matter of fact, my belief is that when it comes to issues that affect the whole planet, such as environmental issues or such as issues about uh, war or issues about human rights or women's issues even, that the leadership really comes from the grassroots. It comes from ordinary people. That's where the leadership comes from. And the political leaders are oftentimes the last ones to understand that this is a problem and that something has to be done about it because the ordinary population knows it a lot earlier, and they're the ones who provide leadership to our so-called leaders. So I think that on the global issues, on the issues of long-term health of the planet, it's the ordinary people that have to provide the leadership. There is a place in Port Hope, Ontario, Canada, where there's uranium waste. Could you please tell my audience how dangerous it is? Well, this is a very controversial issue, and it, it, it stimulates a lot of strong emotions. As I told you earlier, when you have low levels of radiation exposure, the danger is not immediately apparent. You don't see people falling down sick or falling down dead. Um, it, it, what it does is it eats away at people's health. And it's only by, by carefully studying the hospital records and the health records that you can see the long-term effects. Nevertheless, in the early days of the nuclear industry, especially during the World War II atomic bomb project, and also in the years when Canada was selling its uranium for bombs to the United States, there was a great deal of secrecy and a great deal of negligence. And as a result of this radioactive waste in Port Hope, and we're talking about uh, a million tons of radioactive waste, a million tons, was dumped into the harbor. You know, the, they have a beautiful harbor in Port Hope. It's really lovely. They have a marina with sailboats and so on. It was dumped right into the harbor. And also, in Port Hope, they have these beautiful ravines. They're very dramatic. They go way down deep. And kids used to love to go down there to play. I used to walk through a ravine in Toronto on my way to my high school. I loved it. I thought it was great. Well, they dumped these radioactive waste in these ravines. And so they had hundreds of thousands of tons of radioactive waste that was just spread around town. And they also built buildings with it. Uh, like they, they, people would actually take truckloads of this material, this radioactive material, and use it to make cement and use it, uh, they used it to make the playground at, a, at an elementary school called St. Mary's School. And all of this was going on. Remember, the war was back in 1942. Let's say they started back in, well, they actually started in the 1930s because that's when they started using the radioactive ore. But the war started in 1939. So from 1939 up until 
about 1975, you can imagine what a long period of time that is. And during that time, there was a great deal of negligence. In 1975, all of this suddenly broke into the open, and it was revealed that the children in St. Mary's Elementary School were getting more radiation in their lungs than was allowed for atomic workers in the uranium mines. And so they had to evacuate the school. Later they found that there were dozens, there are hundreds of homes in Port Hope that were so radioactively contaminated that they were uninhabitable, even though people were living there. And as I say, it's not because they would fall down dead, but it's because they were, they were, they were at a high risk of getting cancer just from living in their own homes. So what they did was they had to demolish hundreds of homes, and they had to also uh, do a lot of uh, work. Right now, uh, today, uh, this, this repair work is going on. They're consolidating all this radioactive waste. They're going, to, they're going to put steel plates all around the harbor of Port Hope, and they're going to dredge the harbor. And it's the most expensive environmental cleanup in all of Canadian history, and it's going to cost over... One billion eight hundred million dollars. Now you know that's an amazing amount. Remember that a, a billion dollars is a thousand million dollars. So when people talk about eight hundred million, they think that's a lot. Well, a billion is a lot more than eight hundred million. And one billion eight hundred million. Wow, this is a huge amount of money. And all they're going to get for this money is simply repackaging the waste and putting it just in the north part of the town, just a little bit north of the town, in a place called the Welcome Dump. And they're going to put it there, um, and it's going to remain dangerous for for many tens of thousands of years. And yet, the facility they're building to hold it is only designed to last for a maximum of 500 years. So one has to ask the question: Well, wait a minute now. <laughs> I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad you're getting this waste repackaged, but you're not really solving the problem. You're just sort of buying time. Because what's going to happen 500 years from now when it starts falling apart? So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a real problem. And I have to tell you that Port Hope is a beautiful town, and there's a lot of uh, famous people and, and very nice people who live there. And they really like that town, and I can see why. But, uh, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of strong feeling about this radiation. And I think the reason, the reason people get so angry about it is because they feel that somebody has to be lying to them and they're not sure who it is. Because the authorities are telling them it's safe and the people who are the citizen activists are telling them that it's not safe. And so they get, people get very conflicted. They get very uh, anxious when, when they're being told two different stories from people, both of whom seem to be knowledgeable and respectable. And so they say, somebody's lying, but I don't know who it is. And so they get quite angry. And there's a lot of uh, strong passions at Port Hope uh, on both sides of the fence. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it becomes quite polarized. Uh, I'm glad that the government is doing something about it, but I, I think that uh, it's unfortunate that, that this kind of anger has to be there. And I think the reason the anger is there is because our Canadian government, just like the Japanese government, is still not really telling people the whole truth about radioactivity, and about nuclear power. And part of the reason for that is because it's our government, our federal government, that has spent so much money of Canadian taxpayers' money. You know, they, they get all their money from the taxpayers, right? They get it out of our pockets, out of people's pockets. And they have spent $17 billion developing, this is public money, $17 billion of public money invested in developing nuclear power in Canada so for that reason, the Canadian government almost behaves as if they're part of the nuclear industry. There's no distance between them and the nuclear industry. They say the same thing the nuclear industry says. And uh, people are left in the dark. They're not given the complete truth because the people in the nuclear industry and the people in the government don't feel that they can afford to tell them the whole truth. If they tell them the whole truth, then they're going to look bad because they've been they've been people are going to say to them, well, why have you been promoting this stuff all these years if it's not good for us? So that's part of the, that's part of the real problem here is we have a, what's called a conflict of interest. A conflict of interest means that if I'm making my money or if I'm standing in my reputation, if my reputation depends upon something I'm doing, 
then I'm going to be the last one who's going to say it's, it's bad and it should be stopped. And that's the difficulty we're in. We're in a real conflict of interest situation. Yeah. But there's no doubt, there's no doubt that the cleanup that's going on right now at Port Hope, Ontario is the most expensive environmental cleanup in Canadian history. So if that's the case, it's pretty hard to understand how anybody can say that it's perfectly safe. Yes, it is one of the biggest. My mother did work in the government I wanted to make mention of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I work for the government, too. And one of the things you do when you work for the government, your mother will probably tell you this, is you have to take an oath of secrecy. I worked for a branch of the government, which is called the Science Council of Canada. And part of the conditions of my employment was that I had to take an oath of secrecy. And I said, well, I don't like the idea of taking an oath of secrecy. What does that mean? And they said, well, it means that you can't divulge things publicly that the government doesn't want you to divulge. Uh, so I think that that's not a very good policy because it means that scientists in Canada who work for the government are, in fact, muzzled. It means that they're not allowed to tell the truth. So this is not good. And, in fact, the, the current government even has, has fired about 2,000 scientists from the Environment Canada organization. Um, so that they're, but even after they're fired, they're still, they still are uh, under this oath, of, this oath of secrecy that they took when they worked for the government. So even after they're fired, they're not allowed to say what they might have learned when they worked for the government without government permission. Otherwise, they can be taken to court and sued for, for violating their oath. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a real problem. It's a real problem. Uh, maybe someday we'll have a better political system, but I think that that's another thing young people should be thinking about is instead of just criticizing things, like criticizing how the government is and so on, trying to think about ways of really making it really, really better, you know? and. Um, I think that down through history, you know, at one time we used to have kings who had absolute power and we'd had no democracy at all. And, and now we have a system where we elect people and send them to Ottawa. But even those people sometimes don't seem to have much power because they, they belong to the party and the party tells them what to, what to say and how to vote. And uh, that's, that doesn't give them uh, freedom to speak uh, their, their minds freely either. So I, I think that young people should really think hard about how we can improve our system and make it a lot more open and give people, give people the ability to say the truth without being punished for it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you please give us your info? Oh, yeah. Our website, uh, my organization is called the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. And uh, we have been, uh, we actually started in 1975 uh, because of the, the reason we started at that time was because a lot of Canadians were upset because of the fact that India exploded its first atomic bomb using plutonium from a Canadian reactor. And also because at that time, the contamination of uh, children and homes in Port Hope, Ontario had come to light. So that, those were the two events that got the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility underway. And I'm the president of that organization and one of the co-founders of it. And our website is using the initials of Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. It's www.ccnr.org. And uh, there's a lot of stuff there, and it's all in a menu and the menu is hot linked, so if you if you want to look at uh, uh, hazards of nuclear reactors, you click on the link and it takes you to uh, that list. If you look, if you want to know more about uranium, if you want to know more about nuclear weapons, if you want to know more about nuclear waste, or if you want to know more about other aspects of the nuclear industry, um, I'm going to try and reorganize it sometime soon because in the other aspects of the nuclear industry, it talks about like why is it. What, what's wrong with the economics of nuclear power? How much does it cost, for example? What about the exports of nuclear reactors from Canada to other countries? All of that, and, and what about the radiation effects uh, on, on ordinary people? What about radioisotopes? What about those things? Those things are all under the list of called other aspects of the nuclear industry. I also have, a, there is a hot link section called Essays and Answers from Dr. Edwards. That's me. 
And uh, when you click on that link, it gives things that I have written over the years on these different subjects right up to the present time. So if you want to know what I think about things, you can read that section. But these other sections mostly contain things which I have not necessarily written, but which are uh, from other documents, uh, things that government documents, industry documents, or just uh, explanatory, explanatory things. Thank you for coming on to Crystal Kids Radio Show. It was truly a pleasure having you, and I would like to have you back to talk about more of this on my show in the near future. Thank you very much. Please listen to the extended version of this interview since we do not have enough time on my website, www.crystalkidsradio.com. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me on Crystal Kids Radio. Please support us kids on Crystal Kids Radio's Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Please support us kids because it takes a lot of work doing it and it comes from my heart. Change starts from the children. Peace, love, and harmony. See you next week at the same time, same place. Love you.